Welcome to Assembly Calendar. I'm Mike Friesan, and with us for our program today, Assemblyman Tom McKevitt. Now, Tom McKevitt represents the 17th Assembly District in New York State. The 17th District includes parts of Nassau County, specifically the towns of East Meadow, Levittown, Farmingdale, and Massapequa. And we want to thank you folks all throughout the region for joining us for our program today. Tom mm. McKevitt, nice to see you. Great to be here, Mike. I don't know how it is that you're here, but we mm -hmm. sure do appreciate you uh, taking a few minutes out of your schedule today to join us because today, as we tape this program, is final day of budget passage here at the state right. capitol. And uh, it's going to be an all-day affair, all night, day, all night, night affair like it typically is, right? Exactly. That's how the process works. So uh, you're here. Appreciate that. We're going to be talking about the budget, what we know. It's amazing, but here we are, day of passage, and there's still a lot about this budget we don't know, right? That's right. Still being written as far as I know. Yes. Written, printed, mm -hmm. yes. analyzed, negotiated. conference, mm -hmm. negotiated, and then voted on. Yes. All within the next uh, several hours here at the state capitol. Uh, but we got other things to talk about, too. And in fact, we're going to start with what's really kind of a nice thing. Yes. Uh, you had uh, some school kids from the district come on up to the state capitol, participate in uh, an annual event up here in Albany known as Music in the Schools Month. March is Music in the Schools Month. So different uh, students from all across the state come to Albany and sing or yes. play instruments and do all the different things that kids do. And uh, you had a group come and do that just a few days ago. Yeah, I had two groups actually. It's from the same school district, the uh, Woodward uh, Parkway Elementary School from Farmingdale and the Farmingdale High School Jazz Band. Uh, both had an opportunity to do it. And as you said, schools around the state apply and sometimes it takes them years when they apply to finally get there because there are only so many days in the month of March um, that they all compete to get here. But it's a great honor, it's a great privilege for the kids. Uh, for most of them, it's the first time ever seeing our state capitol. They've heard about this mystical place called Albany, but they actually get to see it in person for a day. And we, we just say this all the time, but if there are folks watching this program that have never been to the state capitol in Albany, come on up, yeah. spend a day, and tour the building. The building itself, the Capitol building itself, is a beautiful thing to see. And in fact, uh, you took yes. the kids on the tour. You said the kids are coming, they made it, they got here. Right. I'm going to take the kids on the tour. So we've got some footage now of Tom McKevitt taking the kids on the tour. They started in the assembly chamber, an appropriate place, I suppose, for you to start this thing out. Yes, precisely. Idea, so for actually the actually reason, too, the that uh, the assembly chamber is obviously the largest room in the building, and uh, we had 120 students and parents. Term term so it was a very challenging group to get them all in there. But, uh, you know, when they come with me, they get to sit in the chairs, and that's usually their favorite experience. And then we bring them over to the uh, famous or infamous Million Dollar Staircase, and uh, it's always a great place to do a group shot because the staircase is so perfectly tiered in order for them to do it. But uh, you get to tell them about the history of the staircase and the history of the building. The, the building is just amazing. The European stone carvers came over back in the uh, 19th century. And, and as you can see, every part of what you're looking at there, the parts of the staircase, all hand carved, just amazing. This is the Senate chamber. Yes, which is a, a very unique privilege to get to. It's not easy to get into the Senate chamber. In many ways, it's not easy to get in the Senate chamber. <laughs> but, um, but we're able to bring him in. You're just able to see it's a much more intimate chamber. But, uh, you know, literally the walls are made of 23 karat gold. Um, and I tell people, you know, when you, with, with the Capitol was originally designed in 1867, had a $4 million budget. And 32 years later, it was a $25 million budget. The building was never completed. Uh, they just simply stopped construction because we ran out of money. And fortunately, the Capitol of me gets me very angry some days because it's a symbol of what New York State is. The building had such grandiose expectations. And when you look at the original plans, they're so much greater than it was. But because of corruption, shortfallings, just poor planning, it's less than it could be. And to me, that's really a whole symbol of all New York State. We could be such a great state, but somehow we keep on getting each other's way and preventing that from happening. And that, that's an interesting perspective and, yeah. and how you look at it. But it is a true story. This is a building that came in way over budget. It took a very long time to get from beginning to what they eventually called the end date. Right. Um, and But it is a beautiful building. I mean, you've got to agree with that. Yeah. It is a special, special place. And so much history here. There, there are many governors that have gone on to become president. Mm -hmm. There are many of those governors who became president who started out in the New York State Assembly and Senate. Theodore Roosevelt, you know, just one, for example. Franklin D. Roosevelt, they both started out as assemblymen in the state center. So right. they, they start here in New York. Other uh, names, Al Smith, Tom Dewey, um, it just it goes on and on. And, yeah. uh, and it's just a, a 
we take it for granted because mm -hmm. we're here every day. Yeah. But uh, please come on up sometime and, and take the tour. It'll be well worth it. I guarantee it. Better yet, if you're here when I'm here, I'll give you the tour. <laughs> well, if, I I, if I come over sometime, yeah. will you give me the tour? Absolutely. I'm in. That's right. I'm in. So you can folks come on up. We'll all take the tour together. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and again, before we get to the budget bills, one other piece of business. You debated a bill recently on the assembly floor. I'm going to have to have you explain it to me. Mm -hmm. It had to do with insurance companies paying, I guess, brand new doctors? Right. And you know, this is an interesting thing how bills get developed on the floor. The bill was designed of just having a uniform form <clears throat> for all doctors to go to give insurance companies. That's what most of the bill was about. But buried into the part of the bill, real deep in the end, was provision that's saying that insurance companies then have to go and have to pay new doctors who aren't even certified to work for the insurance company. Now, insurance companies want to make sure usually that you're either board certified or on your way to getting board certified, you have a good history, you don't have malpractice claims against you. This bill is saying, you're a new doctor, start paying them right away, and then we'll figure out if they were a good doctor or not. Seems rather odd, and this is yeah. all. This was all inside a bill that is just kind of about the forms that the that move that process along. That's right. Let's go to the floor of the assembly chamber. See what Tom McKevitt had to say. We'll be back with more of today's assembly calendar. I certainly understand the sponsor's, uh, you know, indication and need for having a uniform form uh, for physicians and healthcare providers throughout the state in order to go and uh, be able to get credentialed, and certainly have different forms. Um, for different carriers can make that quite cumbersome. Um, but I do have some serious concerns uh, regarding this provisional accreditation or provisional crediting of health care providers. I certainly understand the catch-22 that some providers may be in, that they're never going to be able to be credentialed until they're hired first and get the experience. But my concern is, is that there are going to be some patients are going to be forced to go to uh, health care providers that should not be credential at the end of the day um, and may open up a slippery slope whereby people are going to people, to providers who should not be treating them in the first place and may provide some issues maybe with liability to the company as well. So um, just an issue I think that maybe in future consideration of the bill to provide those type of provisions so we don't have people who are really not qualified even though they may be licensed to provide these services uh, for being forced to have uh, provide this care at this time. Thank you. You would think, I mean, it's important to the insurance companies to know who these doctors are and if they want to be involved with them, right? Right. And, and from the planter's perspective, his thought was, well, it's very hard for these new doctors to get the experience uh, because they are new and no one let them do that. And my point is, yes, that is the point. You know, they do have a long residency program. They do have fellowships. We just don't say because you have a license, you're going to go start treating people already when you're still learning the trade at that point. And uh, I think it could have very dangerous consequences at the end of the day. All right, we've got just a few minutes left. Let's talk budget. What do we know about this spending plan? The first thing to talk about, I suppose, is education. Do you, have, do you even know hours from voting on this bill, what kind of state aid you're going to be sending off to your local school districts? When this process began on January 21st of this year, you, the governor presents a budget and gives you your preliminary state aid runs so the school districts can begin planning for the next year. He never released those. First time in history a governor never released those numbers. As we sit here hours beforehand, the schools still have no clue whatsoever on how to plan for a budget vote which is coming up in about six weeks as they go to the voters saying, please approve or disprove this budget, not having any clue how much money will be in that budget. One of the things that the governor, I guess the reason that he hasn't given those numbers out is he says he wants to know if the legislature is going to deal with what he calls education reform first, and if the legislature does and passes a certain provision that he has inserted into the budget, that will determine how much aid is going to be go heading out to local school districts. Do we know if there's been an agreement on that reform package that the governor has put into this budget? There's an agreement in concept as far as uh, they're going to let the state education department go and deal with a great amount on how evaluation systems going to be done. The same state education department which implemented Common Core, and we see what kind of stellar job they did when that came down the pike. Uh, and then they're going to talk about creating a brand new test for districts to administer as well. So instead of having one state test, 
NEAR are going to have a second test on top of it. Uh, they're going to be increasing tenure from three to four years, which I don't think many people have an issue with, but you can only get tenure now if you're found for three consecutive years to be effective. And the effectiveness is not based upon how you teach, but how your students perform. So the way I see it, if you're in an economically distressed area where students have very time hard time learning, or if you are teaching, let's say, special education students, you will never become tenured because those students kind of have a very tough time passing those tests. So instead of attracting the best teachers to the toughest students, the better teachers are going to say, I'm only going to want to go to the easier to pass students because they'll be able to pass the test. So we're not talking about the quality of teaching. We're talking about putting children through drone-like tests, and that's going to determine how we do education in this state now. And everybody's going to start working those angles, even as right. so far as to what's being taught in the classrooms because it's expected that teachers will then, because it'll be so important to their careers, be teaching to the test rather than the way teachers usually teach, I guess. And then, Mike, you know, even when I go and visit those schools so many times as I have over the years, it has become so much more difficult in the last three or so years because all those schools are saying, you know what, Tom, we'd love to have you, but between February and April, we have to teach to the test. Because that's all people are going to look at us at this point. And even though we love having students being well-rounded, that's not how the public is judging us anymore. We started off uh, talking about the Capitol building in this program, and you talked about how it kind of says to you overspending, overreaching, and corruption. We started this legislative session talking about corruption with the arrest of the Assembly Speaker, Sheldon Silver, and charges of corruption and using his position of power to... Um, personally gain out of that. The governor also this year tied into the budget process an ethics reform for the legislature. Right. Any word on that yet? Has that been agreed upon? That has been agreed upon in concept where people have to go and disclose certain clients if they make over $5,000 a year from at this point. Um, you know, what this is all going to do is, is that clients mm -hmm. are going to say, you know, if I have a choice of going to different attorneys, I'm going to pick the one who's not a legislator because then it doesn't get disclosed to the public even though nothing illegitimate is going on. But the problem is it doesn't solve the problem. If the problem was the speaker had access to such great amount of power and such great amount of money as we manipulate things, these ethics bills do not change that one bit. It's not fixing anything in this town. If uh, you had to tell the folks in East Meadow and Farmingdale and Levittown and uh, Massapequa what they should be looking out for in this budget as they start reading the news accounts in the next few days, what should they be looking for? I think you have to look into the details, and the devil's always in the details. And despite the fact that people may have this big generality and how great it is, you really have to make it look at how it works. This is now the third time the governor is going to say that we've had the toughest ethics laws in the country, and still the corruption exists. And you know what, Mike? I'm going to go on a limb and predict that there'll be more arrests and more corruption in the future, even after this law is passed. So we'll see how successful this thing is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's. Uh it's a difficult, I mean, it's a, what, $150 billion, give or take? About that. In, in this thing. And so there's not like there's not a lot of money to spend, and mm -hmm. there's that surplus this year in the uh, settlement monies that the state has received. Are those going to be spent on the uh, capital improvement type projects, the infrastructure? I've heard a lot about that, not just roads and bridges, but also broadband for parts of the state that don't have it now. There will be $500 million spent on broadband, but as far as about $4 billion in infrastructure, no agreement on that yet. That money's been sitting around now for about eight or nine months, and we have projects that can start today putting people to work improving the state. Still no plan on spending it yet. A lot to get figured out in just the next few hours here at the That's state right. capitol. Uh, so we're at a bit of a disadvantage. But by the time we get together again, Tom and Kevin, mm -hmm. we'll have some details mm -hmm. and some uh, better answers as to how this budget's coming together. In the meantime, if you folks want to reach out to your representative, you get a hold of Tom McEvitt at his office in East Meadow, dial 228-4960, or drop an email at McEvitt at assembly.state.ny.us. And Tom McEvitt would love to hear from yep. you as to what you think about what's going on with the uh, state government in Albany. Tom, we have a thanks again mm -hmm. for joining us today. Yeah. We thank you folks, too, for stopping by, and we'll hope to see you soon for our next edition of Assembly Calendar. <laughs>